they're not worried about much in Florida these days. Yeah. So. <laughs> Let's see. Why am I having a hard time? There we go. Well, I'm glad you tuned in. So, were there a lot of people at the dog show? Yeah. I mean, compared to other, a big dog show? It's a huge dog show for the area, but compared to what has been in the past, I don't know if I'm going to go back. I'll answer your question. I just wanted to watch something in particular. So I did. Deborah is an internationally traveled dog show judge. <laughs> and now that you're uh, retired, does that make it a little bit easier? You can do it whenever. Well, welcome. Right as I was about to get started, everybody started meandering away. And so I got my friends um, here on online as well. And Judy, I see you. If you have any questions, you're going to need to type it in the chat because it's not coming. My, my volume is not coming through. We're going to talk about kings and prophets. Who did we talk about so far? Do y'all remember? Saul, David, Solomon. Not we haven't gotten very far into the kings. No. We talked about Uriah, but not not really a king. As we've been talking, like we're like marching through the Old Testament. This is like the meat of the Old Testament, right? This is the history of the Old Testament. What questions have been boiling up for you? What have you been thinking about or you know, what do you find yourself stirring about? Or do you just walk out of here and immediately forget everything? You kind of zone out completely. What comments do you have? King Solomon's temple. Yeah. Yeah. His mind, mind. the mind's underneath, yeah. underneath. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of that today. We're going to talk about where the treasures went. Like, if Solomon had filled up all these storehouses full of gold and like amazing things, where are they now? So, we'll talk a little bit about that. But you know, there's a line in scripture that says, you know, they didn't even weigh bronze because it was utterly worthless at that time, that they had so much wealth and there was just so much gold and silver kind of the symbol that he was just so over the top so powerful right that money almost became worthless he almost tanked the economy because of just so much um it's this idea that like david was building 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 and then finally king solomon sits on top of this massive kingdom and in part it's to highlight the wisdom of solomon in part it's the glory of god that god has produced such overwhelming wealth but what did we talk about last week right that solomon doesn't maintain it like he achieves the highest divine and he's bragging about how his kingdom goes all the way to the Euphrates River and stretches all the way down to Egypt and you know all of Saudi Arabia. But he loses the northern kingdom within his life. So that like by the time King Solomon dies, the kingdom has been torn asunder. And now there are two different kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. So from this point forward today, what, what we will talk about is either Judah or Israel. And Israel meaning the northern ten tribes. Does anybody remember what the capital? You should know this. The capital of the of Israel. What is the capital of Israel? It is most hated by the people of Judah. Samaria, right? Samaria is going to be the capital. And Ephraim and Bethel are going to be the places of great worship. So we're going to talk. You're going to hear Ephraim a lot. Bethel a lot. Those are the kind of high places where people are worshiping God or gods. But Samaria is the capital of Israel. Obviously, what's the capital of Judah? Jerusalem. I'm always like repeating myself over and over to kind of beat this into y'all because it requires repetition. It'd be so much easier if we went, if you know, Deborah went with us to Israel and you go and you sit there and all of a sudden you have like a physical 
understanding of the space, all of a sudden it kind of, everything falls into place. It makes sense. But when you haven't been there and when you don't speak the language and you certainly don't speak ancient Hebrew, there's so many things that need context and need to be reaffirmed again and again and again. How is, let me ask you this. What can you tell me about the kingdom of Israel? The Northern kingdom. What can you tell me about it? Samaria is the capital. They have places of worship. How, what else do you know about Samaria or Israel? Jerusalem is the center central focus of Judah because that's in part where the temple is. It's the city David builds, fortified by Solomon. And yeah, Jeroboam, right? Jeroboam kind of breaks away from Rehoboam, from Solomon, then Rehoboam. Jeroboam builds these two giant golden calves on the north and southern parts of, of Israel and says, we're going to worship here. Like the, God rests upon this whole territory. And he says, I don't want you to go to Jerusalem. There's no need because you go to Jerusalem and you're going to say, wow, that's way better than what we have in Samaria. So I'm not going to go there and you're going to, and people will leave Israel and go to Judah. But that's the beginning of it, right? It's a theological break. If it's a theocracy run by your theology, this is a theological break. So where do you worship? Either in Jerusalem or in Samaria. So that's a huge part. Another part is after the exile, when they return. So everybody gets freed from exile, all the people of Judah. By the time of the exile, by the time Babylon comes in, into Jerusalem and sacks Jerusalem, Samaria has been gone for like almost 100 years. The Assyrian captivity has come and taken over the 10 tribes. There are no 10 tribes. There's only Judah by the time of the Babylon, Babylonian exile. And by the time Jesus is walking around in Galilee, there's no northern tribes. It's just Judah and like the larger Palestine, Palestine area there is no like northern tribes so the people of samaria had been kind of infiltrated by the assyrians mixed marriages blending of people they're not pure semites any longer you know so abraham abram comes from ur and he comes from an ethnic group called the semites that's why he can be anti-semitic it's its own ethnic group of people <clears throat> just in the way that like i don't know i suppose like Japanese people are their own ethnic race, right? We are, it's a unique ethnic DNA code. He is a Semite. The people of Israel are supposed to be pure Semites and it's passed down that Semite ethnic gene is passed down from mother to child. The father, it's great if the father can contribute, but it's passed through the mother, right? Jesus is born through the Virgin Mary. He comes through this Semitic lineage. The people in the northern Israel are no longer pure Semites. They're now this blended ethnicity. It was really offensive at the time of King Herod. King Herod comes. He's appointed by, um, by Rome. King Herod is culturally Jewish, but he's not Semitic. He had been raised in the southern part of what would be Judah, but near what we call Palestine today. He's like kind of on the edges near what in King David's time would have been a, the Philistine area. He's raised Jewish. King Herod is raised Jewish. His father is like a big wig in the military. He rises up kind of as a star politician. He gets appointed to be governor over Israel. And he's like, hey, this is great. I'm king of the Jews. I am a practicing Jew. I've always been Jewish. But they're like, no, 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 you're not a Semite. We are of different ethnicity. So like, it doesn't matter that you're Jewish. Like you're not really Jewish. But they appointed him over this whole greater Palestinian area that included Jerusalem and Samaria. And they called him an ethnarch, saying not just a monarch, but you are the monarch, the king of this ethnic group of Palestinians. And this was really upsetting to the people of Jerusalem. They're saying, we are not ethnically related to the Samaritans. We're not the same. Like, you're Canadian, I'm Mexican. Like, it's different ethnicity, right? And amongst themselves, that was very significant. That God's covenant was supposed to come through the Semitic people. This is our group, our ethnic group of people inherit God's blessing. And yet, we're going to see God still working through the kingdom of Israel. Just because the two kingdoms have split, we're going to kind of get into this today. 
God doesn't say, screw you guys, Northern Kingdom. He says, no, I will also provide for you. You are my descendants from Abraham. You are part of the great inheritance that I promised. So that's why we're going to see God still working through Israel and Judah, if that makes sense. What is the significance of land? But what is the significance of land to the north and south kingdom? Why is the land so significant? Because, I know you all just like ready to jump in there. Because this is how God's covenant is made real in the world. How do we know that God is with us? He's giving us this land. This is the promise that we'll have children and grandchildren, and this land will pass through all generations. That's how we know. Land is significant. Oh, my goodness. we got some Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. Everybody hide your popcorn. We, um, we know that God is real and tangible here because he's made known through this land. This is the gift. This is the blessing. Very detailed on which families get which parts of land. It's very specific at which tribes are inheriting which areas and which zones. And it says, you know, there's a law that says every 50 years, it's supposed to return to the ancestral owners every 50 years. So every generation, the land is returning. So if this is a uh, land of uh, Judah, belongs to the families of Judah and the tribes of Judah, it has to return to the Judah family every 50 years. So if I buy a piece or sell a piece or if I take a, a vineyard for myself, it has to return because it's part of that ancestral blessing. Up to this point, up to this point in the Old Testament, there's very little conversation about what happens after death. God doesn't give great commandments about heaven and hell and eternity and sitting in the sweet by and by. There's nothing of that. How do we know that God is real? He gives us health. He gives us wealth in the form of like goats and cows and sheep. And he gives us land and he gives us children. So there's like four things. So when we read the book of Job, four things get taken away from Job. His health, his wealth, his children, and his land. Well, he keeps his land, <laughs> but then everything else fails. And that's the, the theological crisis. Where is God when I'm losing the promise of God? So we're going to talk today about Baal and about Baal's boob. We're going to talk about kind of where we get some of our notions of Satan and heaven and hell. But the, we have to erase that context when we're talking about King David and the kings of Israel. They didn't have concern for that. It was land, even land in Israel. Okay, the book of Samuel and Kings are meant to be two continuous books. It's meant to be one book of Samuel and one book of Kings that are a continuous history. They're divided into first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. We believe because the scrolls were too large. So when people were writing and the scribes, you know, the ancient rabbis were copying these, it was just too much to roll into one giant, huge scroll. So you'd write, cut it in half and then you'd wrap it up for a way to storage, a way to keep it and preserve it a little bit easier. There's a lot that we don't know. We don't know exactly who wrote it. We don't know if there are multiple authors, if people are writing pieces or, if, you know, Kevin wrote three fourths of it and then Lynn took it and embellished a little bit more. And then Joel took it and added a little bit more flourishes on down the line. We don't know exactly if there's a author or several authors or if it evolved over time or if it took place during different kingdoms. We know something started getting written about King David around his time. We believe that there are some Psalms attributed directly to David, whether those were written by David or written in his kingdom or in his era, it's hard to say. There's some things we can infer through the development of language, kind of more archaic language, newer language. There are people who study just the history and evolution of Hebrew. It's very complicated, but it certainly wasn't finished until after the exile. How do we know this? Because, you know, somebody's not writing about King David in real time when they're also telling about how he dies, right? That it's a continuous story until kind of the exile. It's building up to the exile. And so the, the great thought is that it's compiled after the exile. Somebody's coming back and telling this broad story. Here's the history of Israel. There's a famous historian named Josephus. Josephus was a Roman historian, not Jewish in any way. Y'all have heard Josephus. And like he wrote famous, you know, antiquities. He was a historian. He is one of the few people who wrote about Jesus just as a matter of history. 
They're saying there's this guy named Jesus. They thought he was king of the Jews. Like he was killed by Pontius Pilate. He claimed to be the Messiah. And he writes as this very secular person about Jesus, which is like really wonderful and interesting. But he starts way back. He starts, you know, 400 years before Jesus. He's a historian kind of writing this story. But if you really want to know about the rise of, of Hellenistic area around Palestine, if you want to understand the rise of the Roman civilization empire, you read someone like Josephus, who's writing it after a lot of things have occurred. That's the way we get it. The book of Chronicles is a little different. So you get first and second Kings kind of giving us these full, rich, embodied stories. First and second Chronicles, again, it's just a narrative, but it starts from Adam all the way to the exile. And it seems like that was written. It seems more that one person is writing it as a continuous kind of like Josephus. I'm just going to write the history from Adam until the exile. It's more to the point. A lot of it is redundant. Like they'll take stories like the stories of King Ahab and include that. That's almost verbatim from first and second Kings. Take the story of Ahab, put it in Chronicles. But there's a lot of editing too. There's not all the stories of Ahab, not all the stories of Jezebel. It's not the story of Elijah killing all the prophets of Baal, perhaps. So it's shorter. And really after that big divide, they'll mention the kingdom of Israel a little bit, but really after the big split, it focuses more on the kings of Judah. So it seems like it's written by somebody in Judah because they're more concerned about Judah and Jerusalem. And it's somebody who's trying to create a narrative. Some people, ancient rabbis, thought it was written by Ezra because Ezra comes next. It goes first, second Chronicles, then Ezra. So it's like the story from creation to exile. And then Ezra starts in the return of exile. Ezra, the book of Ezra is written by this guy, this prophet, you know, quote unquote, Ezra, who's saying, here's what happened after we were let free from exile and how we come back. Cyrus the Great released the prisoners, the captives. They come back and they rebuild the temple. As the people are pro processing into Jerusalem and they're so excited, they go and ask the people of Israel, hey, will you help us rebuild the temple? You know what? We've been cut off. We've been cut off as family for a long time. And we've been cut off from our land for the last 70 years, like three generations. Will you help us rebuild the temple? And what do the people of Israel say? No, like y'all go screw yourselves. Like we got better temples here. Does not bode well for future relationships. It goes Ezra and Nehemiah, these two prophets, Ezra and Nehemiah. They're going to be telling the story of the rebuilding after the exile. And then it's really interesting because we have the story of Esther and Job. So the way the people compiled the Bible, the way the Bible was it's not, if you just read the Bible, it can be confusing because it can be jumping all over the place. You need kind of timelines to make everything unjumbled because some of the prophets are writing during some of the lives of the kings. But instead of having them overlap, instead of breaking it apart, like now we're going to read about King Josiah and we're going to also talk about Jeremiah, the portions of Jeremiah that happened during the life of Josiah. No, instead you have the book of Kings and then way down here, you have the book of Jeremiah. But they're kind of overlapping histories, if this makes sense. It's interesting because you have Chronicles, the story in Ezra, the story from creation to the return from exile, and then Esther and Job, which are not considered prophets. What is unique about Esther and Job? What are those? What is the kind of book we get in Esther and Job? Yeah, it is a story of personal tragedy. <clears throat> exactly. Well, I'll say this about prophecy. There's two ways to prophesy because we're going to get into prophets today as well. There's two kinds of prophets. There's a prophet who foretells the future. If you do this, bad things will come. If you sin against God, the tornado will be unleashed. But there are other kinds of prophets who simply are are proclaiming the reality of what's happening now there's another kind of prophet like jeremiah who's saying you are turning away from god and that will cause bad things to happen you are moving away from god and it, the prophetic voice of jeremiah isn't predicting the future he's not saying fire and rain are going to fall from heaven what he's saying is i as a as your prophet you are abandoning god so there's two kinds of ways of understanding 
so Job is Job is not a prophet. We and we don't consider Esther as a prophet, quote unquote. These are books of wisdom. There's several books of wisdom, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. But we consider Esther and Job books of wisdom. They're not supposed to tell us necessarily the history of what happened. They're trying to teach us something about the experience of God in this world. We believe Job is one of the oldest. They say we think it's one of the oldest or first written down texts because it's a, we found the oldest remaining examples of that. And also because of like hints in the language that it's more archaic. But it's supposed to teach us about the very nature of God, right? This is who God is. How does God work in a world uh, with megalomaniacs? Well, we read the story of Esther and we understand how God is working even through these kind of evil pagan gods and how he's working through his faithful people like Esther who are willing to stand up to the king. So you have the story from creation to exile. Then we have some books of wisdom followed by Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Now, who wrote the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon? It's like, were they scribes? Were they prophets? Was it a combination of lots of people? Was it just David sitting down writing a bunch of stuff? People think, you know, it's historically attributed to Solomon to write Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. What people tend to say, are you all familiar with Ecclesiastes? There's another book called Ecclesiasticus that's in the um, Apocrypha. If you're a Roman Catholic and you have the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha is a section of books uh, like Bell and the Dragon, Ecclesiasticus, where you say, these are good and they're morally uplifting and spiritually enriching, but they're not scripture. But they are part of our history and worth reading. Protestants have taken those out and say, well, if they're not the canon of scripture, even if they're morally uplifting, we don't need them to be part of our canon of scripture. So we don't have those. Roman Catholics wouldn't say they are scripture. They'd say it's part of the Apocrypha, which is kind of this addendum ecclesiasticus can get a little wonky ancient rabbis the word on the street what they had said was that song of solomon was written by solomon when he was a young man which makes sense because it's very uh romantic it's very lovely it's like your sheep look like your teeth look like freshly shorn sheep on the hillside your neck is like a tower of ivory like it goes on and gives all these beautiful almost erotic love songs to the beloved and it, it's a kind of this love song to god but has this very romantic you know flowery people said the rabbis ancient rabbi said it was written by solomon as a young man which kind of makes sense it's like this love songs like a young man in the heat of youthfulness is like proclaiming proverbs is written by middle-aged solomon as he's like growing to be king and he's wise and he's giving out deep thoughts and deep ideas in Ecclesiastes was written by old man Solomon. So people, the ancient rabbis thought that as he was like getting elderly, this is like the deep wisdom. It's like, there's a season for all things. There's a season to live and a season to die. You can kind of see an old man like waxing poetic, right? Spouting Ecclesiastes from his, his deathbed. There's a season for all things, a season to die. And then there are the prophets. The prophets come after, of course, all these other things, but they were happening at different periods of time over, you know, 400 years. The prophets span this massive amount of time in history. And so they're talking to very specific and real periods of history. But if you just read the prophets with, without placing them with the king to whom they're attached, it can kind of be disjointed. You don't know what's happening in the world. In the same way, if I give you like, I don't know, a journalist, um, like, for instance, I take political writings from Benjamin Franklin, and I take political writings from, I don't know, Richard Shelby, but I don't tell you what time of history they're written, right? It's going to be wildly different. They're both politicians. They're both, you know, popular enough that we know who they are. But, like, the world has evolved, and the world is dynamically different from Ben Franklin to today, although Shelby is retiring, isn't he? And so we're going to elect a new senator soon. But you can imagine, like, over that period of time from Ben Franklin until today, like, America is radically different. And that's, you know, how long ago has Ben Franklin? 300 years? 1776, I guess. 
Okay. Name me some of the prophets. Just throw them out there. Anyone, anyone you can think of. Elijah is a prophet. Elijah is interesting because he's not, he is, yes, a prophet and very prophetic. I want to talk about him in just a minute. But he's not one of the quote unquote prophets that he doesn't write a book. There's no book of Elijah. But Elijah is not just a prophet. Elijah is something beyond a prophet. He's like next level. He's a player. He's a priest. He sacrifices to the altar of God. Not every priest is a prophet. Not every prophet is a priest. He's sacrificing in the temple. He's sacrificing animals. So he's a priest as well. He's also like a miracle worker. And he's also not a magician, but like he's doing things of extraordinary. He's doing extraordinary things. Elijah is like uh, magically being transported. Elijah is calling fire down from heaven. He's bringing back someone from the dead. Not things you're going to see from Jeremiah or Isaiah or, or Obadiah or Nehemiah. These are different ways of being a prophet, if that makes sense. He's doing kind of great works of God. In some ways, unlike anybody else ever before or until Jesus himself. So, for instance, Elijah and Elijah. Elijah, right, being the successor to Elisha. My favorite story about Elisha is like he's just been appointed this new prophet, he just like gets the mantle from Elijah. He just saw fire from heaven. These young men, he walks through the woods and these young men are taunting him for being bald. And what happens next? He like says a special prayer. I need to find out what this prayer is. He calls out a special prayer and like the she bear comes out of the woods and kills all these young men who are like making fun of him for being bald. What's up now? <laughs> Revenge of the bald. Well, Elijah does these deeds of great power, right? He appears we don't know anything where he comes from. We don't know his backstory. We don't know if he's married. We don't know where he comes from. All of a sudden, he's there, and he's super-duper famous. We see he's fed by ravens. He predicts and ends this great drought, which is going to be very, very significant, as we talked about Baal versus God and the prophets of Baal versus the prophets of Yahweh. He, Elijah is going to end this massive drought. He's going to predict it and say, a drought is coming. Prepare yourself. God provides for him during the drought. And then he's the one who says the drought will now end on my word through the power of God working through me. He defeats 850 false gods, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. Does anybody know what the difference between Asherah and Baal? Great. I'll tell you in just a minute. He's magically transported places. Like it says, you know, different times he's here. And then all of a sudden he's somewhere else. There's another prophet that sees him, and he says, hey, go tell Ahab that I'm coming. He's like, no way, man. I'm going to go tell him. Ahab's going to be pissed. Probably going to kill me. And you'll just be magically transported somewhere else by the time we get back. Like, that's just how it goes with Elijah. Apparently, he just vanishes, and that's the thing. He calls down fire from heaven to destroy soldiers, 50 at a time. They're coming up to arrest him, and he's just like, kill him, Lord, kill him. Fire comes down, burns them all up. Man, got to learn that prayer as well. You know, he calls down fire from heaven to light this. When he has this kind of sacrifice off, he has this showcase showdown with other prophets of Baal and Asherah. And they can't get God to light their fire. And he burns his up and it burns theirs up. And, and he never really dies. You know, he goes taken up into heaven. And there's this idea that he, since he never died, there's this ancient Midrash, this ancient Jewish tradition that he's still alive. Like, and that's why. If you have a good Passover feast, you're supposed to leave an empty chair for Elijah just in case he comes back. Isn't it vain, though, to think that he would come back from heaven? Elijah has been gone this whole time. He comes down from heaven. He's been alive for like 3,000 years in the presence of God, and he wants to eat at your table? Like, what is your matzo ball recipe that's so good Elijah would want to come and dine with you? It's a little vain. But that's why if you go to a good Jewish kosher family supper, you know, especially in the Passover, they're going to leave an empty chair for Elijah. Because he could come back. In part, that understands the transfiguration. When Peter sees Jesus with Elijah and Moses, like, oh, yeah. Like, Elijah never really died. Elijah has always been kind of alive. And this is why people keep asking Jesus, like, are you Elijah? Are you the one come back? Like, are you John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? Is... We don't know. Elijah's a crazy person. Baal and Asherah. Baal is 
kind of in some ways a very generalized name for God. Okay. The people of Ur were the Semite ethnic group. And there was another ethnic group already in this land of Cana Canaan, the Canaanites. Now there's, you know, Phoenicia, Phoenicians, the people of Ugarit, they produce the Ugaritic writings, which are the Ugaritic writings and Akkadian writings are really kind of the oldest writings that we have from the ancient Near East. That's where we get, if you've heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh, if you're familiar, if you've heard of this, this is Ugaritic. These are different ethnic groups. They're all living around the land of Canaan. So God gives them this blessing and inheritance of land. It's already filled with people. And all of those people, the Akkadians, the Ugarites, the Phoenicians, uh, the Philistines, they have a menagerie of gods. It's kind of an ancient understanding of God. This is very land-based. And almost like putting yourself in the mind of the Inca or the Aztec or the Maya. Like you think of native peoples in America. They have a very land-based understanding of God. God is the one who brings the sun. God is the one who brings the rain. God is the one who brings the harvest. And there's this balance of the gods. There's day and there's night. There's the male and there's the female. Baal is the male understanding of God. And Asherah is the female version of God. Asherah is kind of the fertility God, one who's more lifted up and celebrated by the women amongst us. There will be Asherah temples that are presided over by women by women priests and the bible sometimes will often call them you know prostitutes we'll get into that in just a second Baal is the male version Baal is the god of war he's the god of rain and he's the god of climate control it's a generic name and it can and we see it in kind of with different epaulets depending on the people and depending on the season and how they're worshiping him through mesopotamia came canaan uh the Amorites, the God of thunder, lightning, and he's a very present God. If we're living in a drought right now, look today, Louisiana is about to get destroyed by a hurricane. It's like the people in South Louisiana need to be praying to the God Baal. He's a very real God. He's a God who has power over the weather and over what's happening. <clears throat> There's a very real connection. Well, the, lots of images of Baal. He can be represented several different ways. In this, you see him kind of holding lightning bolts. You see him kind of like an Egyptian pharaoh. I know it's hard to see this um, carving, but he's holding like a thunderbolt in his hand. He's the thunder god. But in a very real way, like when they manifest him, he's made in the image of a bull. This is why it's very offensive to God when he comes down, when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, and they've made a golden calf. They say, we want something real, something present, something that we understand to worship. They make this golden calf. They don't just make a golden calf for no reason. This is what the local gods were like. When people wanted to worship God around Cana, the land that they're trying to enter, they would worship the image of a bull. A bull is also a very rich image in Jewish history, right? When they build the temple, they put this great basin to purify yourself on the backs of 12 bulls. There are is good bull imagery even for as christians if you look at upstairs we go upstairs the golden book i use for the gospel one of the gospel writers his image is of a bull i forget which one but one of them is an image of a bull one is an eagle one is i don't know something else there's four of them upstairs we can go and look but one is a bull it's this image of baal that is offensive to god when they make it, Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments and saying, you can't even wait for me. I've come to give you the very word of God, and you're already trying to create this image right now to worship. It's also why, in part, it's offensive to everyone when Jeroboam, what does Jeroboam build in the northern and southern parts of his kingdom? A golden bull. The Ark of the Covenant has two angels that form their wings, form this throne, the seat of God. But the seed of God in Israel are two bulls. And it's God supposed to be sitting on his throne on the backs of these two bulls over top of Israel. In the dry summers of the area, explained as Baal's time in the underworld. And his return was said to cause the storms which revived the land. Thus, the worship of Baal in Canaan, where he eventually supplanted,
planted L fault for its agriculture. Let's see. Oh. Unlike Egypt and Mesopotamia, which could focus on irrigations, right? Egypt has this fertile river, the Nile River, and you can irrigate that and use that to plant your farms and divert water from it. In Israel, right, you just go over the Continental Divide past Jerusalem, and it's just desert all the way. It's just endless desert of, that goes into Saudi Arabia. It's Lebanon, and then Saudi Arabia forever and ever. It's just sand. You go in the other direction, it's the Mediterranean Ocean. The only water source is the River Jordan, which is nice. It goes from Galilee down to the Dead Sea. By the Dead Sea, it's dead. Nothing left. So you only have this one river, really, this one water source. And above that, you don't have much water source. I mean, of course, you have Syria north of, of Israel. But you got to go a long ways to get to the Euphrates. And there's no way water would ever get diverted down into Israel. You can only plant crops. You're subject always to rain. If you need fresh water to rain your crops, you're not going to get it from the Mediterranean Sea. It's got to be. So in part, people living so dependent on the land have this very real connection to this need for water. And in part, that's some of the idolatry. The local God, Baal, is the one who provides water for the land. Follow me. As vanquisher of the sea, he's regarded by the Canaanites and Phoenicians as patron of sailors and seagoing merchants. The sea people were, of course, the Philistines. The, they were thought to have come from kind of the islands, the Greek islands, the people who were sea merchants and sea travelers. Your mom's in the back. Come on in. Baal was the main god of the Philistines, who are the hated enemies of the Israelites, right? As vanquisher of Mot, the Canaanite death god, he was known as Baal Repaiuma and regarded as the leader of the Rephaim. The Rephaim was as the ancient spirits, particularly those of ruling dynasties. The Rephaim, do y'all remember, do y'all ever watch uh, Lord of the Rings? The last Lord of the Rings movie, like, Jonathan, you've watched Lord of the Rings. Who's the king? King Aragorn? Aragorn. Aragorn goes and he finds this army of dead spirit warriors, right? He sails in his boat. They arrive and all these like dead spirits jump off the boat to go and fight on his behalf. There's this idea that people have died. Their spirits are still alive. And now they're warrior spirits who live forever and have very real connection and can like affect the world. They're called the Rephaim. Literally, the spirits of the dead ones, of the spirits of the dead kings, right? The Rephaim. So there's this mythology, the Baal, this cow bull god, has gone down, defeated Mot, the king of the dead armies, and now he's become king of the spiritual world of these, this army of the dead spirits, right? David fights Goliath in the valley of the Rephaim. The Rephaim are also the giants of the Old Testament. When it says, right before the story of Noah in Genesis, it says, the world has been corrupted, where angels have come down and made babies with people of the earth, and these have become the heroes of old. It's this idea that these have become the giants that live among us, the Rephaim. When Moses is coming up into, uh, in, to take over the land, Moses and then Joshua will be fighting the Amorites, the Hittites, the Philistines, and the Rephaim. King David fights Goliath, who's a giant. He's said to be one of the last of the Rephaim. Do you see this connection? Baal is the god of the Rephaim. Baal is the god of the Philistines. Baal is this kind of great idol in the land of Israel. And so as the people are coming out and God is being just so like, hey, you need to kill everybody, destroy everything. Don't leave this king of the Philistines. Don't leave the king of the Amorites. In part, it's God's being victorious over Baal. It's saying that there's no room for any other God, that this is the real living true God. The first name of God, if you're reading in Hebrew, is El, right? El is the word we would use as God. So they have Baal and we have El. So if you think of um, Nathaniel, means in Hebrew, Natan El. Natan is uh, to give or like a gift. And El is the name of God. So it'd be like the gift of God or the one who gives God, right? Natan El. So when you hear names like Mike, 
Michael, uh, you know, Daniel, they all end with that E-L. That's the divine name of God. L greater than Baal. Y'all tracking with me? Baal Zebub. Baal Zebub is Baal. In one of, and we'll see Baal Zebub uh, here in Second Kings. Baal Zebub can be translated a lot of things, but it was a version of the name of Baal. So I don't know if y'all saw the show or read the book, Good Omens, it's a famous book written in England like 30 years ago. They just made it into a good show. Baal Zebub is very real and present in the show as one of the demons of, you know, the great Satan. He's like one of the lesser demon gods, Baal Zebub. Now here's like the nuance of language too. So we know Baal is this kind of general word like G-O-D, lowercase G-O-D, it's God. Zabub, here's the nuance of language. I was thinking about, I was thinking about how it's funny. A farmer sows a seed, right? A farmer walks along and sows a seed. A farmer raises sows, S-O-W-S, right? He raises female pigs, a sow. Now, if you were to go like 2,000 years into the future, where the language is completely different, it's evolved completely, but they're going back in time and they're trying to understand the difference in the story like there's a children's storybook about a farmer who sows and tends the sows it can be very confusing and so you're trying to parse and understand what exactly and is it like oh are sows and sows related because because they're both on on a farm because they are both tended by the farmer because they're the work of the farm and you try to like extrapolate and you can maybe make all these legends and mythologies around it because you're trying to figure out the language in reality it just is spelled the same and looks the same and means there is no connection between the two but this is the funny thing of language like zebub it could mean flyer like someone who has wings and flies around or there's this idea there are contexts where it's used like somebody is killed in battle their guts spill out all the shit from their guts fall on the ground and then flies are attracted to that heap, that dumb heap. And so in that sense, Zabub could also be the flies attracted to poop. So for instance, you see in like Good Omens, when Baal Zabub is present, he has flies all over him. And so sometimes he's called like the king of flies or like, you know, he's portraying that image of having flies. But you see a lot of ancient art where he has wings. And in part, it's because we don't really understand language as well as we should. It's a, we're trying to figure out and we're wrestling with language and we're trying to discover language. In the same way that over time we learned a new Hebrew word. We learned this Hebrew word that means to radiate. And so Moses comes down from meeting God and his face radiated. But there are famous uh, sculptures of of Moses, especially through the Renaissance, where Moses has horns, because they thought the word was that he came down from the, from the mountain and had horns. So you see a really famous like Renaissance sculpture of, Dave, of Moses with horns. Well, we just had to learn this new word. We're still trying to understand language and we grow with language. So you see you know, images like this, where Baal Zebub is the winged one. This is an image of Baal, right? Which would probably make more sense than the fly god, the god of flies. Asherah was this female fertility god. You know, kind of like totem poles, but it, the idea was that they would carve them from trees that were still standing. So they take a living tree and carve it. So you might have a forest of these Asherah temples. Asherah, well, Asherah was this kind of divine female representation like y'all watch da vinci code or you've read da vinci code right and like they're really exploring this idea of Susie, so come in Catherine is in atrium if you want to see her they're exploring this idea of the virgin mary is she like you know the yin and yang of god is she the divine matriarch is the virgin mary the queen of heaven asherah one of her titles was the queen of heaven and she was supposed to be the counterpart to the male baal there's some confusion because the Old Testament likes to use the word of prostitutes in like the Israelites are prostituting themselves out before other gods. So that's a very rich image that is used quite a bit. They refer to the Asherah 
priests, priestesses as prostitutes, but sometimes there's occasions where the traditional Hebrew word is actually means priest. And it could be just a way of being a little bit more degrading to those places and to the, to the women, or it could be very real. It could be that they are temple prostitutes because we saw temple prostitution around the world. It was a very real thing, you know, certainly in Babylon, Greece, Rome, India, Japan, Indonesia, Maya, among the Maya, Aztec, and the Inca, a mother-in-law who teaches Latin could tell us endlessly what that was like in Roman culture to have Roman temple prostitutes. But even into mo modern cults, right? Y'all heard of Nexium? Like recently there was just a trial for this guy and there's a real famous actress, not, she wasn't real famous, but it's famous now that she was an actress and became part of this cult. And it was in some ways this weird like sex cult. Or y'all remember David um, Koresh, right? They have like this almost weird sex cult and that sex is part of the way they're all experiencing community together. <laughs> and so as we're talking about the kings of Israel, King Ahab, his wife Jezebel, and the Bible does not like, whoever writes 2 Kings does not like Jezebel at all. Jezebel is kind of the great evil one. She's the one who's going to bring worship to Asherah in particular. So in particular, she's bringing all these foreign idol gods, Baal, and especially Asherah, and setting up apparently these like temple, these temples to Asherah with temple prostitutes. The problem, of course, that God is always trying to fight against, that God is railing. He's like, I'm giving you this land. Don't let there be any foreigners and don't marry any foreign, foreign women. Whatever you do, don't marry foreign women. One, because how do we pass our ethnicity on to the next generation? Through the women. Two, the women are going to be the ones who lead you astray to worshiping false gods. Jezebel comes in. She's not going to give King Ahab a pure Sem Semitic child. And she's the one bringing worship to Asherah. She's the one defiling society. And again and again, we're going to see this. Now, there are contradictions in the Bible, right? Because Ruth is a foreign woman. And she will be the great-grandmother to David. So she marries into this Jewish family. But Ruth is herself a foreigner. So there's contradictions. We'll see that. Oh man, this doesn't look as clear as it did when I was putting it together. It's kind of a nice graphic. It looks like it's, you know, from the late 80s, early 90s. <laughs> it looked cle cleaner when I was putting it together. But I want to just give you some of the timeline between which kings and which prophets were happening so we can start to wrap our minds around it. Again, there are three big times, big three prophetic periods. There are people who are prophets before the exile. That's everything before exile. They're prophets during exile, and they're going to be the prophets after exile. Some of the prophets after exile are very easy. Ezra. Ezra is writing about King Cyrus coming in, creating this new world. Some of the prophets during the exile are easy. Daniel. Daniel is like obviously taken as a captive. And then there are some who are going to be a little bit wonky. Like Jeremiah is going to be straddling the line. He's there before the exile into exile. Isaiah is a little wonky. You know, if you look at the time period of Isaiah, it's like 75, 80 years long. And so it's like obviously more than a single lifetime. Like Isaiah is not writing for 80 years. So some people think there might be one or two or maybe even three different periods of Isaiah. Like there's Isaiah and then he's passing on to his, you know, next generation student and the next generation student are kind of continuing the prophecy. But you see Isaiah stretching kind of long before the exile kind of deep into the heart of exile. Also, this graphic is going to show us like if they did good, if they did bad. So Saul, he did kind of bad. Ishbosheth, his son, he dies really quickly. David, he does good. <clears throat> okay, man, these graphics aren't very strong. This is just going to show us who was good and who was bad. So all the green, all the graphics in green, these are the kings of Israel. I'm going to read them to you so you don't have to squint. Just easy. Everyone who is pink, these are the names of the kings. Everyone who is pink has done evil in the sight of the Lord. Everyone who's green has done well in the sight of God. 
and the kings who are yellow are like kind of in the middle. On this side, I'm going to read these names so you don't have to guess. On this side are the kings of Judah, and these are the kings of Israel. And you can see how their timelines line up to each other. Okay, so on the left, it's Judah. So you see King Rehoboam, the son, direct son of Solomon. He does evil. He doesn't do really well. His contemporary on the right is King Jeroboam, King Jeroboam of Israel, the northern tribes. He also doesn't do what's good for God. For He does not walk in the ways of the Lord. It takes Rehoboam's grandson, Asa, who rules for this long time. He does awesome. He's the king of, of Judah. He brings people back into line, back into true worship of God. He rules for tons and tons of time. And he sees one, two, three, four, five, almost six different kings of Israel come and go during his reign. So you see this quick succession. Now, what you notice also in this graphic, if you could read it, but you can't. But in this graphic, you see the middle column is the relationship to the previous king. You see the kings of Judah are all the sons of the kings of Judah. It's a direct lineage, direct inheritance. That was the promise to King David. Your sons and your son's sons will live on as my kings forever. On the right-hand side, you're going to see the relationship. Jeroboam was not the son of Solomon. He was the servant of Solomon. So you're going to see a disjointed relationship for the kings in the northern tribes. So you'll see Jeroboam is his son. Uh, Basha has no relationship whatsoever. He just takes over, throws a coup, becomes king. You see that several were the captains of the army. They have a military coup. They take power and control. Some of them pass down their sons. Uh, king Ahab, his son takes over, his grandson takes over, but then he's overthrown by Yehu. Yehu is like, he's in yellow. Yehu's the king of Israel. He's not neither hot nor cold. He like sometimes does what's right in the eyes of God. We can go, we're going to go more slowly through these, through all these kings. Not all of them, but the ones who have interest. But again, you see on the left-hand side, these are the kings of Judah. On the right-hand side, these are the kings of Israel. Why do the kings of Israel stop before the kings of Judah? Because the kingdom of Israel stops before the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Israel comes to a complete and abrupt end. It's overwhelmed by the Assyrians and what will be called the Assyrian exile. It's, it's like perhaps a bad, word, bad use of the word exile because they're not just exiled. They never return. So it's just like the destruction of the northern tribes. They're gone. Some are taken in slaves. Some are killed. And then the rest intermarry. Assyria comes and they bring their soldiers and they bring their winners to interbreed and repopulate the land. So you see right at the beginning of the reign of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is king. He's the grandfather, the great grandfather of King Josiah. During Hezekiah's reign, he will preserve his people from the Assyrians. We actually have these like, you know, you can go and see these carvings and these writings from the Assyrian king saying, oh, it's great. I trapped the Israelites. I, I trapped the Judeans inside Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. But the Bible has a different reflection. Say Hezekiah preserved his people and were able to live inside of Jerusalem and not be overwhelmed by the Assyrians. So you see King Uzziah, he's green. He does really good. Jotham, you see Hezekiah, great king. And he's the great grandfather of King Josiah. Some people suggest that a lot of what we read in these books of First and Second Kings might have been written during the reign of King Josiah. Second Kings is very favorable to King Josiah. It says, no one before or after King Josiah loved the Lord his God as much as he did. There is some idea that Deuteronomy, or at least a big portion of Deuteronomy was written during the reign of King Josiah as well. We see overlap from what Josiah will do as king and what it says in Deuteronomy. Traditionally, like ancient tradition is that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. But of course, he dies at the end of the book. And so it's hard to write about your own death in your own autobiography. Okay, this is a little bit easier graphic just to show what king aligns with which prophets. So we see like King Saul, 
lives with Samuel. Obviously, Samuel spreads out over Saul and David. And we see Nathan, you know, as Nathan is also very prominent in calling David out for his shenanigans. And again, you're going to see on the left, Judah, and on the right, Israel, because there are different prophets in the different regions. So, for instance, Rehoboam, you know, all the way through Asa, they have two different prophets, lesser prophets that we don't really concern ourselves with. You see Ahab, King Ahab, who's king of Israel, is where Elijah comes. Elijah is going to be all over the place, and he's going to go down into Judah some, but mostly Elijah is going to be in Israel in the northern kingdom. This is harder to see, but then you're going to start to see the prophets that we think of as recorded in scripture. So, for instance, on the left, when King Joash is king of Judah, it's Joel. Joel is going to be far, far before, not terribly far, but before the exile. Then you're going to see Isaiah begins with King Uzziah and stretches all the way from, he goes from Uzziah all the way down to Hezekiah. It's a big period. Now we're getting close to the exile with King Josiah. We're going to be ramping up towards the exile. You're going to see a lot of the prophets in Judah, like Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, obviously, being on, as, as it's coming, as the Babylonians are coming and taking people into exile, Lamentations, the great book of, of sorrowfulness. On the other side, you know, we see Jeroboam II. These are the kings of Israel. That's the time we're going to see Amos, Hosea, Jonah, Micah. Although Jonah is a book of wisdom, and we're not exactly sure when Jonah was written. Okay. Let's just stop there for a second. Let me look at my chat here. Jeremiah. So, I've given you a lot of information they might be all jumbled up and now confusing you don't have to this there's no test so you don't have to remember who was prophet during which king all that to say that the bible is written in a confusing way there is a bible that someone has produced where it's a linear a chronological bible so as you're reading the bible it breaks it up to like what's happening in contemporary like so if you get to uh king josiah and the story of king josiah it might interspersed parts of Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Jeremiah. I, that's confusing to read because that's not the traditional way that most of us are taught to read the Bible. But it's also confusing to read the Bible because things are happening simultaneously in real time. You know, Isaiah is being written during the kingdom of Uzziah as, and, you know, Hezekiah, as the Assyrians are coming in and destroying the Northern kingdom as people are dying. Isaiah's writing, you know, Oh my gosh, turn back to God or this could happen to you. Um, it's like the third book of the game of Thrones. The problem with game of Thrones, you know, they haven't published the last book of game of Thrones yet. And I heard one commentator saying, well, maybe he just can't think of any more names. Right. <laughs> because it's like every, you know, there's like a thousand characters and to keep all the characters straight is just impossible. And we get that into the, into the Bible as well. But if you can keep the character straight, it's going to make a lot more sense. It's going to actually make a lot more sense in your mind. It's going to flow a lot better. Do y'all have questions about Baal or Asherah or the Kings and prophets? Is Asherah a holiday? I don't know if there's a holiday to Asherah. Not federally recognized, at least. No, I'm not sure about that. Okay, so this is interesting. So next week, we'll talk about yeah, I don't know what Ashura is. Okay. The spelling, I'm sure, is significant. 
Yeah. We'll talk about this next week. Next week, I'm going to start getting more into the details of the kings. And I want to talk a lot about Ahab and Elisha being the contemporary prophet. One of the great things that Elisha does is he's, you know, at Mount Carmel and he has this great battle, this kind of prophet off with the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And he has this great moment where he builds up, you know, his sacrifice, butchers the cow, pours water of the cow three times, and then he calls down fire from heaven. It gets consumed. And then he takes all 850 of the other prophets and kills them. So he takes them down to the Kishon Valley and murders them all, which is significant, right? It's God utterly cutting off the prophets of Baal and Asherah. It's like God making this finality. Like there's one God and one God alone, and he destroys them. Now, you know, you think he must have had help. Ritually killing 850 people is like a full day's work. It's like, how do you even do that? Yeah, and like, do those guys just like wait patiently to be killed? A lot of questions involved there. And, and whether it happened exactly like that or if it was the symbolic, you know, that he destroyed them completely. But from the base, from the Kishon Valley, it says where he takes the, these prophets and kills them. It's at the base of Mount Carmel. From that base, you're passing over. Um, what is it? Uh, well, from there, you can see this valley, Har Ageddon, that's it. You, you can see Har Ageddon, the mountain of Ageddon, <laughs> Har Mageddon. It's the mountain of Megiddo is what it is. So what you do is you see Har Megiddo, which later in Greek becomes Armageddon, but Har Megiddo is the great valley where they had all the wars over centuries and centuries and centuries for 2000 years. All of the wars of the Near East were fought in the valley of Har Megiddo, in part, we get this word Armageddon. It's kind of the last battle will be taking place supposedly in this valley. So the valley where um, King Josiah will be shot and killed. He's fighting a war against the Egyptians. This is a great valley to fight because it's a flat space. And it's a converging point from, from Turkey and Greece coming this way and from uh, you know, Mesopotamia, from Babylon and Assyria coming this way and Egypt coming north. It's where all of the armies converge, Armageddon. So you're staying at the base of Mount Carmel. You can see the valley of Megiddo, Megiddo. And on the far side, you see the mountain, like Mount Tabor, and the mountain where Nazareth is built. So when you're on Nazareth, when you, where Jesus is born, right? Mary Magdala is from, or Mary, uh, the Virgin Mary, is from Nazareth. You see the house she was raised in. You can stand on the hillside and look out over the valley where thousands of years of battles were fought. And you can see Mount Carmel. And I think there's something profound about this. Jesus being raised in such a way that he can see kind of that history of war and of violence, of brutality. But he also, every day, as a young child, walking around that area, can also see kind of the great victory of God. That's Mount Carmel. That's where Elijah defeated the false gods. And I wonder what that would be like for us in our lives to have that physical daily reminder to look out and say that's the place where god won that's the place where god destroyed the idols i don't know something interesting to think about okay i gotta end all this uh because we got to go upstairs and so all my people online sarah and rick i see you all have some questions and why don't rick and Sarah, you email me those questions so I can answer them. And I'm going to run upstairs right now. Stop my recording.